reorganize my mic here briefly. Well, first of all, I just want to uh, express my appreciation for the welcome to Algonquin territory and also my appreciation to Satsan and to Catherine and to Francis for including me. It's, it's humbling for me to be here. Um, I'm not an indigenous person, I'm not even a Canadian, but someone had the courage to invite someone from the United States, which is in a state of considerable disarray today, to come up here and say a few words. And um, I'm going to talk really from my experience as a researcher working on some of these issues for the last three decades um, in the U.S., to some extent in Canada, also in Australia and in Aotearoa, New Zealand. But um, I can't claim that any more than Kent, that I can tell you what you should do or how you should do it. What I can do is share some experience with you and hope that that turns out to be useful as you wrestle with what I think are extremely daunting but also exciting challenges. I'm going to start by taking you out of North America entirely. This is, you'll see a little white space in Central America there in that map to the right, that's the country of Belize. And I thought I would just give you a quick story about Belize. Belize is home to, among others, a number of Maya communities. And um, in those Maya communities, which are in the southern portion of Belize, a good deal of oil and gas has been discovered. And the Maya people argued to the government of Belize that they should have some control over what happened with that oil and gas in their communities. And the government of Belize disagreed. And that ended up going to court. And a former colleague of mine, someone some of you know, Jim Anaya, who professor of law at the University of Arizona and former UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, he's now dean of the law school at the University of Colorado. <clears throat> Jim Anaya was one of the lead litigators in this, in this case. And they won the case in 2007 in the Supreme Court of Belize. And it was appealed to the Caribbean Court of Justice. And that affirmed the victory. And Jim told an interesting story to me uh, during a visit to Belize. We were doing a little bit of work there. And Jim said, you know, when that final victory came down, which basically said to the Maya people, yes, you have the right to control what happens on your lands with oil and gas development and other things. In a sense, it was a recognition of the rights that you also have been fighting for. And Jim said at that, when that decision came down, there was a massive celebration in the Maya communities. And one of the Maya activists who'd been at the heart of this whole process came up to Jim in the middle of that celebration and he said, Jim, we won, we won. Now what? What do we do now? I think that's the question in front of, of you. Listening to Satsan and to, and to Kent, in a sense, you've won. It's fragile. It could be challenged and doubtless will be. The enemies are all over the place. But the fact is this window of opportunity is open. And the question is, what do you do the day after the treaty signed? What do you do the day after the settlement's announced? What do you do the day after government says, yes, you have that right? Or what do you do the day after you discover that you've had an utterly inadequate governing system thrust upon you that was designed by someone else to serve their purposes and not your purposes? That's the governance challenge. And I once said to someone, you know, at the end of this fight for self-determination, there's a big prize for the winners. It's called the challenge of governance. And it turns out to be at least as difficult to pull off as the fight for self-determination was. And in many ways, far more important, because it's really saying, what are you gonna do with the right that you won? And we're seeing this kind of change happening I think over much of the world, this microphone doesn't like me. We're seeing a shift 
And I think of it in these terms, I think of it as a shift from, that has several dimensions, from the rights battle to the governance challenge. And when I say in parts of the world, it's happened in the United States, it's happening in Australia right now, not thanks to any actions of the Australian government or for the most part courts, but because a lot of Australians have concluded if we don't seize the initiative ourselves, if we wait for government to recognize our rights, we'll die waiting. That was said to me by an Aboriginal man there. That's our choice, die waiting or act. So let's seize the initiative and pursue our own agenda. So it's happening in many places. It's a, cha a shift in action from pursuing rights to putting them to work. In issues from national policy, and what's that going to be, to what will your policies be? Once you're in the driver's seat, your nations, your policy makers, what will your policies be? From a concern with what they do, the feds, the provinces, what they have done, what they've done to you, to a concern with what we, First Nations, are going to do. And it's a change in skills from the litigation and lobbying and protest that were so much part of the self-determination struggle to now nation rebuilding skills. Kent just gave what to me is a, a thoroughly compelling argument of why you, why you have got to make yourself into law-making nations. Because if you don't make the laws that govern what you do, someone will make them for you. And then you have to live with those laws. So you have to think of yourselves as, as you were. This is not new, this is very old. But it's bringing back what you did so well for so long, making law, deciding how to live, how to relate to each other, to the natural world, to the spirit world, to these newcomers showing up, taking control. And it also means remembering that rights make things possible, but they don't make things happen. That's up to you. So, if the rights issues are no longer an obstacle, and I don't want to be glib about that, I realize this is a never-ending fight. You have to defend what you've won. But let's say the rights are not currently the obstacle. What else gets in the way of the governance challenge, meeting that challenge, making things happen? And I think it's certainly in some of the nations I've worked with, there's fear, fear of making mistakes, Fear of what happens if you let go of the government subsidies? What will happen to our people if we let go of that? Will they take it away if we become assertive? We have the learned assumptions about how the world works and all of you have already today, and I think I wanna thank many of you for your, your candor and your frankness about the learning that eight generations of the Indian Act have produced those learnings, that learned helplessness, that dependence, those become the burdens that you have to find a way to get rid of. So those get in the way. Lack of information, this comes back to the education piece that so many of you have talked about already today. How did we get into this mess? Do our children understand it wasn't always this way? That we once governed? and we were successful in often harsh and difficult environments for hundreds of years because we knew how to govern and we did it well. Is that part of what our children learn about who they are? And what are our options for getting out of it? And where are the success stories? Where are the, the nations that have pulled this off and how did they do it and what can we learn from it? And then you deal with the organizational and behavioral legacies of the Indian Act that have come to be treated as normal, as one of you already said today. And by the behavioral legacies, I, and this happens on both sides. You may have won the rights, but you still gotta deal with the bureaucracy that is used to operating in a particular way. 
that whole bureaucratic structure of the Indian Act didn't change when you won your rights. It's still the same structure. It's the same people with the same assumptions who when you call up are gonna react in exactly the same way. And so the challenges become very large and the educational job becomes very large because it has to happen on both sides of the divide. I also think we've, there's some big questions that come up when you start to engage the governance challenge. Who are you? That may seem, I think you all know who you are, so I'm gonna explain in a moment what I mean by this. But it's a pretty important question, and I think it's particularly important in Canada and Australia, more so than in the United States and Aotearoa and New Zealand. And I use those four countries because they're, they're the ones I know the best. What kind of people or nation do you want to be generations down the road? And how do you create a government of your own that can move you toward that goal, whatever it is? So let me just look quickly at each of these. You know, it strikes me that part of the history that you have been burdened with in Canada is a history of fragmentation, and I hope Satsan won't mind, but in an early conversation years ago, Satsan was, who I consider one of my teachers, was telling me about making a visit to the AFN and they asked, well, what nation are you from? And he said, I'm from the Wet'suwet'en Nation. And they thumbed through the Rolodex and said, there's no Wet'suwet'en Nation because it all got fragmented into multiple First Nations and each one was told, you're a First Nation now. And Satsan, I don't know if you remember, but you said to me, and I said to them, what do you mean there's no Wet'suwet'en Nation? We've been a nation for generations. Well, you're not in the Rolodex because Canada shredded you and said, no, no, these 250 people who were in a fish camp this summer when we showed up and got them signing a treaty, we've decided you're a First Nation. So that then gets rigidified into the administrative structure of Indian affairs. So we're seeing some nations resisting that, like Tanaha in British Columbia. Mr. Zhou is here from Clicho, the Grand Council of the Crees. We have Australian examples where people got they just shattered peoples and forced them into communities where they could deliver services to them more efficiently. It was efficient to shatter peoples. And so part of what you face, not everyone here faces that, but this is what I mean by who are you? Because for small nations, it's difficult to govern. It requires a lot of people. I had an attorney here in Canada say to me, you want to tell me that we need to build a government in a First Nation community of 250 people where only half of them are adults and half of them are dysfunctional? What does building a government mean? So you may need to think, some nations may need to think about who can we join forces with and on what basis? Do we share culture and do we share language? Do we share a problem? Do we share an ecosystem or a watershed? Do we share a history that makes us, that is a, a sufficient bond for us to work together and rebuild and begin to govern? Or are there certain things we should do with, that we share? Maybe not our whole government, but perhaps we should do institution sharing in a particular domain or a particular area. And I'll give you one quick example from the United States. This is the Northwest Intertribal Court System in the Pacific Northwest of the US mostly in Washington state. It's a consortium of small tribes who in the US, as I think some of you know, Indian nations can build their own court systems and, and many have done so and obviously some are doing so here as well. Some of you may be involved in that. But uh, these nations realize we're too small to run our own court system. But if we join forces with people we trust, we could build a consortium that could supply adjudicatory services, train judges, those of us who want to build a court system, we can build it, et cetera. That's institution sharing. This has become an integral part of the judicial, indigenous judicial system, enforcing the laws that Kent talks about, the laws that these nations make. And that kind of institution sharing is a governance strategy to try to address another of these damaging legacies of colonialism. What kind of nation do you want to be? I'll take you again away from 
North America for a moment. There's Aotearoa, New Zealand, the Maori people of that country suffered many of the things you did from residential schools and the suppression of language and culture to the complete expropriation of their lands and so forth. But in the 1990s, a number of the Maori tribes, or iwi, as they call themselves, succeeded in reaching settlements with the government of New Zealand, settlements that did not restore their lands, but did provide a very modest compensation for the loss of some of those lands. And a few of those tribes have become very wealthy as a result of the, that compensation and have become major players in the New Zealand economy in forestry and dairy and fisheries uh, in parts of other kinds of agriculture. One of the architects of one of the two biggest settlements there is a man named Tippany O'Regan. He's now Sir Tippany O'Regan, having been knighted by the crown. He's an elder of the Naitahu people, the large iwi of the South Island of New Zealand. And Tippany O'Regan, he's a very interesting and very thoughtful man, and he fought for years for that settlement, for New Zealand to acknowledge what they had done and to provide some compensation to his people for what they had lost. And they got that settlement, and it has been the source of their economic power today. But Tiffany O'Regan got worrying in recent years that maybe we've become too enamored of that economic power. And perhaps we've forgotten a bit of what our long-term purpose is. And he gave a talk in Australia a couple of years ago, and I thought it was a very powerful talk. This is Sir Tiffany O'Regan. And here's what he said. If that's all the membership of an indigenous culture amounts to, then why bother? And he went on, Do we just want to be rich Pakias? That's Maori for white people like me. Do we just want to be rich Pakias with a suntan? Is that our goal? Or is our purpose the intergenerational transmission of identity and heritage? And by heritage, he means everything from land to ceremony to language to kinship relations to the identity young people carry in their hearts. And I think this is a critical question. If you're going to get into governance, you need to know why. Because your governing system needs to reflect your purpose. Otherwise, you're just trying to figure out how to run social programs or how to manage a business. And if that's all you're about, that's fine. But when you get this right and you embrace the governance challenge, then these are the kinds of things that I think we've seen some nations beginning to wrestle with. And I think they're crucial issues. So how do you create a government that can move you toward that goal? Um, I'll give you just a few examples here. I'm going to go through them quickly, but they're sort of examples of process, I guess, but also examples of some diversity. They're from the United States. Uh, and, and I use them not because you should do the same thing, but just because I think they illustrate people trying to move down this road. So this is the White Earth Nation in Minnesota. They're Anishinaabe people. And they operated for a long time under a government that they did not design. It was de not designed by the United States for them to serve U.S. purposes. But in 2007, they decided it's time for a change. We now want a government that is our government. Well, they launched a constitution process to create their own government. They asked each community in the White Earth Nation to nominate delegates to a constitutional convention. Well, that constitutional convention turned out, turned into four conventions over a period of two years. Forty delegates from across the nation wrestling with the issue of how should we govern. And they didn't start by what should we change in the U.S. version of the Indian Act, which is the Indian Reorganization Act. It wasn't made quite as comprehensive and intrusive as the Indian Act was, but it certainly screwed up enough 
stuff. They didn't start with that and say, what do we want to change in it? No, they started from scratch. What do we need to do as a government? We need to be able to do the following things. How will we do them? So small groups worked on particular issues through those two years with a principal writer pulling it all together, a citizen of the nation. They did a lot of research on what other nations had done, and not only indigenous nations. They looked at constitutions from countries emerging out from under Soviet control in Eastern Europe. They looked at the Japanese constitution, which I think was mostly written by the US military. Um, they looked at a lot of different stuff. They were looking for how do other people deal with these issues. And eventually, they produced a constitution, was ratified by the delegates and voted on and adopted by the nation. Well, it turned out, I wish I could say this is nothing but success, but they've run into trouble with the Minnesota Chippewa tribe, which is the prevailing governing system designed by the United States, and I'd say it's an open question whether the white earth nation constitution will end up being their government, but this is what they did. And they ran that process themselves. Those 40 delegates did not include a single person elected to council. Several council people sat in on meetings as resources, but what they wanted was the community engaged in this, not following some political leadership, but following those who could engage in a conversation about who are we, who do we want to be, how should we govern? This is the Osage Nation in Oklahoma. In 1881, the United States abolished the nation's own system and imposed its own rules over Osage lands. In 2002, they created a commission to listen to the Osage people and form a government, a product of the Osage people. They did a survey of, I think it was something like, well, it was multiple thousands of people, held meetings in every community, engaged in all kinds of discussion, and they ended up with a constitution adopted by a two-thirds majority of the nation, and they had agreed that that would be sufficient. And in 2006, they formally transferred the authority. And there's a photo, I wish I had it, I'd show it to you, of a banner across uh, the street in uh, Pahuska in Oklahoma on the day of the celebration of this transfer of authority, and it says on it, Osage Independence Day. There was a big celebration of the Osage Nation constitutional government. Citizen Potawatomi Nation, this is a large nation, 30,000 citizens and a whole lot of them left because the place, there were no jobs in the 1970s. It was one of the poorest nations in the United States. People were fleeing from conflict and poverty and powerlessness. And so they have populations in a lot of other places, this history of poverty. But in 2002, they embarked on a major reform of government based on community input. And their determination was the fact that people had to leave our home because there were no jobs and because times were bad doesn't mean they're disconnected. We want any Potawatomi connected to this nation to have an opportunity to participate in our government. And so they adopted a new constitution in 2007. They have a lawmaking body of 16, a legislature of 16. Eight of those seats have to be filled from within Oklahoma. The other eight are filled from districts into which they've divided the United States. And they run their council meetings by video conferencing. In their council chambers, there are video screens on the wall. And if you sit in a council meeting there, you'll see the representative from the West Coast District in LA or San Francisco or someplace, vote, engaging in the discussion in real time, voting on the issue. And they say one result of that has been people keep coming back now to Shawnee, Oklahoma because they feel reconnected and they come home and they say, tell me more about who I am. That's a, that's a kind of, of nation rebuilding of pretty profound proportions, I think. Well, these are all new nations. We also have nations who fought to maintain their traditional ways of governing. The more traditional Pueblos, such as Jemez, Cochiti, Tesuki, some of the others, they've continued to govern in ways that have very ancient roots. At a place like Cochiti Pueblo, there are no elections. There's no voting for leaders. 
They have no written constitution. They have no written legal code. The cacique, you can hear the Spanish colonization in the term, but it's continued. The cacique, the chief spiritual leader of the Pueblo, calls the people into the plaza on December 29th and appoints the people who will run the place for the next 12 months. And you don't have an option to say, gee, Mr. Cacique, I really appreciate that. It's a very generous offer. I've got a job at Los Alamos. I'm sorry. No, the Cacique says, you're the governor? You're the governor. Suck it up, 12 months. And I said to a man who had been governor there when we were there learning a lot of this, I said, so you don't have a constitution? He said, not a written one. We have a constitution. It's written here. You learn it from your parents, from the medicine people. You learn it by living in this community and learning how you should behave, who has what authority, how decisions should be made, and then you defend that constitution. And it's reconfirmed every year at Coche de Pueblo when that cacique calls the people into the center of the village. The first thing he says is, do you want to continue to govern ourselves this way? And for hundreds of years, the answer has been yes. All right, here's who's gonna be leaders for the next 12 months. So what you get is changing governmental forms over time, where pre-invasion you had self-determination and what you had was different nations governing in different ways because as was said just over here earlier, you're diverse. How the Gitmiao decide to govern is not gonna be the same as how the Crees decide to govern. And then what happens is, and this is true in all four Kansas countries, along comes colonialism and it says, nope, you gotta govern this way. And you get the Indian Act or the Indian Reorganization Act, or the Office of the Registrar of Indigenous Corporations in Australia, or the regulations governing how iwi should organize in Aotearoa to manage the assets they've gained through settlements. And what we're seeing now as a result of the fight that you've made is the reemergence not only of self-determination, but of diversity. So now we're seeing a change back toward multiple forms, but they're different from before because they combine your traditions and beliefs with the demands of the contemporary time. And it's that hybrid thinking that says, we know what we value, we know what we believe, but how do you do that in 2017? And it's that solving that problem that I think is the approach to the governance challenge that works. Now it's not working for me either. Here we go. So some of the elements of this process of addressing the governance challenge, this is really just recapitulation, education, the community needs to know its history, know how it got to this point and what the cost has been, what's been lost. Relearn the meaning of government. You know, in the United States, the US government has done a very successful job of teaching American Indian people that government is about handing out goodies. Who gets the houses? Who gets the jobs? Who gets the money? Who gets first in line for the health care? That's become what we call in the US tribal government, be come to be about for many people. The Pascua Yaqui tribe, there were a whole lot of people running for office. I said, why are so many people trying to get on the council? It's kind of a thankless job. And this guy said to me, best jobs on the res, man. They got the highest paychecks. Oh, so that's why you want to be in government. It's not very promising for nation rebuilding. But I think the Canadian government has probably done just about as good a job. I don't know it as well. But certainly in the U.S., we've persuaded a lot of people to have what to me is a Mickey Mouse notion of what governing means. And what we need to do is restore a notion that says your government is this instrument that the nation has with which to build the future it wants. And that's all it is. That's what a government is. It's just a tool. It's not the nation. It's not God Almighty, 
It's not sacred. It's a tool to build a future that the people want for themselves. So we have to change that. And that involves engaging the community in reimagining the future and in the concrete tasks of governmental design. So that what you end up with is something that the people feel is theirs. And then they'll defend it. Have to change the conversation. And some of these words have already come up today. Oren Lyons, the traditional faith keeper of the Onondaga Nation in, in uh, the United States and, and a leader of the human rights battle, once said to me, are you a member of the United States? He said, in Onondaga, we're not a club. We, we don't have members. We're a nation. We have citizens. I remember Mike Mitchell once telling me how when he first became Grand Chief at Akwesasne, he said to the council, anybody uses the colonial words like reserve instead of homeland or territory, reserve, you gotta put a quarter in this pot in the middle of the council table. Or if you talk about the band instead of the nation or something like that, I can't remember all the ones he told me. He said, you gotta put a quarter, well, they used the money to buy donuts or something. But he said, you know, it only took about four or five months because people started saying, hey, hey, hey you, can't, you just mentioned reserve, man. Put a quarter in the pot there. And he said, pretty soon people change their language. That's part of changing the conversation. Tell the stories of other nations that have met this challenge. I think, you know, the learned helplessness and the fatalism, same old, same old. We got a new... We had an election, new people coming in. Yeah, it'll be the same old, same old. That kind of fatalism is deadly. And it's also part of what keeps what Herb calls the monster of the Indian Act alive. We just accept that it'll always be this way. And so even if you start to make change, the monster recaptures you. And those stories of success change people's sense of what's possible. Because as someone once said to me, if that tribe won't name the tribes, but they're traditional enemies, and this one person said to me, well, if that tribe can redo their governing system, we better get on the stick and redo ours. But that's right, those stories of success change people's sense of the possible. And in the process, and I say this with complete respect for lawyers and politicians, but have them take the back seat for now. These things have to come from the people. I was in a meeting on a, one of the Lakota reservations where some attorneys had, were asked to come present to the community their proposals for change in the constitution of the, that particular Lakota nation. And these were two Lakota attorneys and they said, well, we've been through the constitution and here are the changes you should make. And the room was silent. This was grassroots people from that community. And finally, a woman at the back of the room stood up and she said, your job isn't to come here and tell us the changes we need to make in our constitution. Your job is to come here and ask us how we want to govern and then go and build a system that does that for us. And I think that's the way to think about it. You start with what the community wants to be and then you go to the best resources you can find to say, help us create that. And finally, whoop, time. These things are time consuming and you don't get it right the first time. One of the nations we've done some work with on constitutional reform, they've built a review into their constitution. They've basically said every 10 years, we wanna take a step back and say, what's working and what ain't? And let's fix what isn't. Because these are hard things. My job is a piece of cake. I go out and talk to people and learn what they're doing and then try to tell other people what we've learned. But your job is to actually do this stuff. And I'm very much aware of which of us has the tougher task. Mine is a cinch. Closing thoughts. Track indigenous innovation. It's happening. It's happening. And it's not just in Canada. Pay attention to what's happening in other places. 
indigenous people set free turn out to be the best judges of what they need and they innovate. Record the stories of success and record how they happened. Build an accessible network of indigenous interaction on these topics so that nations can more quickly and easily learn from each other. What someone said at the start of the morning this morning in introducing themselves, we don't do this often enough, we don't talk to each other enough. But that's how you learn, is if those guys crack that problem, I'm gonna go talk to them. How'd you do it? Can we do something like that? And assemble key learnings from the wealth of your own experience. Thanks very much.